Hi, everybody. It's so great to see new faces and some familiar faces from the accessibility community and beyond. My name is John Freilich. I'm a professor in computer science, and I do research in accessibility and human-computer interaction. We're so delighted to share a bit with you about the accessibility research that we do in the Allen School. Um, I first want to start by mentioning CREATE, which hopefully some of you have heard of by now, but is still a relatively new center. So CREATE is the Center for Research and Education on Accessible Technology and Experiences. And our mission is to make technology accessible and to make the world accessible through technology. And our director is an Allen School professor, Professor Jen Mankoff. Uh, one of the associate directors is in the audience over here, James Fogarty. I'm also one of the associate directors. And so if you're interested in getting involved, we do have a Slack, um, a Create Slack, and there's a Create mailing list. And there's lots of opportunities throughout the year through Create events. We're going to have a holiday party. There'll be a poster fair and other things. So if you're interested in accessibility research, that's uh, a way to get involved. There's also a seminar for graduate students where they do readings of accessibility research. So I'm really delighted to have four PhD students in the Allen School come and talk with us about their research in accessibility, from everything from uh, notebooks, computational notebooks and their accessibility, to the intersections of race and disability, to using LiDAR and computer vision to scan indoor spaces for accessibility, and also video conferencing. Um, and ways that we can caption that for accessibility. You'll notice, too, that we have live captions today over here on this screen. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Venkatesh Potluri, who is a PhD candidate advised by Jen Mankoff. He understands accessibility barriers experienced by blind or visually impaired developers participating in high-skilled programming domains such as data science, physical computing, and user interface design. His research efforts contribute new interaction techniques to accessibly program and real-world systems that improve developer tools. And Vegatesh is on the job market this year and uh, is absolutely wonderful in all that he does. So with that, Vegatesh, please take it away. Thanks, John. Hey, everyone. I'm excited to be here to talk about our efforts to gain a data-driven understanding of the accessibility of computational notebooks. I'm speaking on behalf of my colleagues, Sudish Singhanamala, Nusara Tianklin, and Jennifer Mankoff, and all of us are from the Allen School. Allen School. Computational notebooks give us the means to combine uh, data and code and text narratives, opening up a variety of storytelling possibilities. The illustration that you see on screen, taken from Rula Tal's work to understand notebooks, shows the variety of information that can be included in these notebooks. Data can be included in the form of images, tables, code, and text narratives. The, versatil the versatility of these notebooks makes them uh, widely used in educational and research contexts in both academic and industry settings and a variety of domains, ranging from uh, data science to astronomy to chemistry. That brings us to the next obvious question. Are notebooks accessible? The simple answer is no. In fact, an accessibility analysis of the Jupyter Notebook software resulted in a grade F, causing them to display this warning that you see on screen, which says, warning, as of January 2023, this software is not accessible. Significant work will be required to reach that goal. We wanted to understand why notebooks were inaccessible and how inaccessible they really were. So we chose a data set provided by JetBrains, which, a developer tool which is a developer tool company of 10 million notebooks, and uh, randomly chose 100,000 notebooks. For the first step of our analysis, we filtered for notebooks that uh, uh, you know, were written in Python and had images, and we ended up with about uh, over 39,000 notebooks. Uh, Filtering for Python enabled us to perform uh, program analysis uh, using Python's ASD to understand more about what kind of code was written in these notebooks. And also, you know, uh, we've extracted output figures from these notebooks and, ed and ended up with about 340,000 uh, figures. We, for the next step of our analysis, we enriched our data set. And, and for this, again, we had these 100,000 notebooks. Uh, we've applied. Uh, popular themes that developers used and exported notebooks to HTML, because that's one common way that notebooks are often shared and distributed, uh, and ended up with about 590K, 590,000 notebooks. And then 
we've, uh, we've applied two accessibility scanners on these notebooks and then ended up with about a 239 million accessibility errors, warnings, and notices. We've also collected information about structural elements in these notebooks, such as headings and uh, tables, and we use the information about our image from, you know, we use the images previously and use machine learning based approaches to understand what types of figures were plotted in these notebooks. For our manual screen data testing, we randomly chose a subset of notebooks and uh, tried to get to structural and data elements in them, and I'll talk more about this soon. Broadly speaking, we found out that notebooks were inaccessible because of how we authored them and the tools and infrastructures that we use to create and share these notebooks. Images continue to be inaccessible in notebooks. Let me explain why. Here, I have a graph where on the x-axis, uh, we have number of images, and on the y-axis, we have the percentile notebooks that contain these, the number of images. Uh, note, I recognize that these graphs may be hard to understand fully when they're presented in a talk. I'm, trying, I'm going to describe everything, and I urge you to read our paper to get a deeper understanding of the data. Um, We've, noted, we've learned that of the notebooks that contain images, uh, about 50% of them contain at least four images, as indicated by the red highlight, and 1% of notebooks contain over 100 of them. Unsurprisingly, none of these images had any useful alternative texts. The alternative texts that you see on screen on the, from the word cloud, such as open in collab and image, are clearly not telling us anything about the content in the notebook or in these images. We wanted to dig deeper and understand why this was the case and found out that the popular libraries developers used to uh, plot these figures did not support the inclusion of alternative texts. Here I have a horizontal bar plot where the x-axis shows the number of uh, imports and the y-axis shows this data for top 10 libraries and popular libraries that developers used to plot figures such as Matplotlib, Seaborn, and Pandas did not support the inclusion of alternative text. Tables are another way of uh, presenting data in notebooks. In fact, best practices do recommend that tables be included and tables and descriptions be included with figures. Tables in our notebooks were very large. Here I have a graph where on the x-axis we have the number of rows or columns and the y-axis contains the number of, uh, you know, percentile number of tables that contain those many number of rows and columns. Green line represents rows and pink line represents the data for columns. We found that on average, a uh, table had about 15 rows, that's fine, but about 145 columns, making it super hard for screen reader users to navigate through these tables and understand them, or even skim through them uh, to go past these tables. Well, coming back to this uh, graph that we saw earlier of notebook, uh, images in notebooks, there are about a 60% of notebooks that do not contain images. Does that mean they're accessible? The simple answer, again, is no, but let's find out why. As I said, we've applied themes to notebooks. Uh, as you can see on screen, some of these are Jupiter's default light and dark theme, and others include Darkula, Horizon, and Solarize. Sometimes these themes represent uh, how popular IDEs look. And Upon running an accessibility analysis on these different themes, we've found out that the Jupyter's default theme is not accessible, as shown here in the graph, where the x-axis is the number of errors and the y-axis is the distribution of uh, number of errors, and the red line shows the data for, uh, for the Jupyter's default. Just by changing the theme from default to horizon, which is indicated by the green line, we were able to see a significant reduction in accessibility errors of about 85%. Note that the difference may not be uh, clearly visible in this graph because of how it's represented, but we do urge you to read our paper for a deeper understanding. Uh, and all the other themes that you see here are somewhere in between uh, the uh, you know, horizon and the default theme. Cool. Uh, as I said, we've performed manual screen reader testing where we've categorized notebooks across different size buckets and chose a random sample of notebooks, 10 notebooks. We've tried to get to different data and structural elements using single key navigation shortcuts provided by screen readers. What this means is that we tried to get to all headings using the H key, tables using the T key, and graphics using the G key. Notebooks that were as large as uh, the largest bucket, which constituted for about 1% of our notebooks, had the potential to crash Windows-based browsers and screen readers. This is extremely important to address because uh, a good number of uh, blind or visually impaired developers and data scientists do use Windows as their primary platform. 
I want to talk, uh, take a minute and talk about some impact that we're already seeing and what's next. Um, first, we, we, uh, you know, doing this work has given us a comprehensive understanding of what accessibility issues in notebook might, notebooks might look like and helped us develop some of these metrics to say what a notebook is accessible. And we've, been, uh, we've actually presented our findings and had a conversation with the accessibility working group for Jupyter, and we're trying to explore ways in which we can make some of these findings more actionable for them. Um, in, but, you know, even after everything that we know, I think we need to do a lot more and we need to do a lot better. To begin with, uh, developer you know, notebook software vendors should provide accessible defaults. We really wish that Jupyter and Matplotlib, for example, can work together and support the inclusion of alternative text. We also think that themes are something that are like user preference based, and we wonder if there's a possibility that uh, themes can be applied after a notebook is exported based on a user's preference because uh, you know, it's, it's essentially a CSS change that is happening to the HTML file. We're also at a point where we're thinking about how we can get AI to help us better write code. And uh, this also is important, to, uh, it's an important time to think about if this includes accessibility, and it should. For example, uh, code generation tools can uh, suggest the inclusion of tables and text description when there's a figure, and they could also suggest the inclusion of headings when the notebooks start having too many cells. Finally, though we have a, a, a uh, an in-depth understanding of some of the accessibility issues that are in notebooks, we do need to learn a lot more, and some of these require more nuanced understanding. And we hope that we as a community can get to a place where we truly define what does it mean to create and share a truly accessible notebook. To help with all of this, we are making our code, data set, and experiments publicly available for researchers to use. You can access them by scanning the QR code that you see on the right side of the screen, or by going to blvi.dev forward slash notably hyphen artifact. In fact, uh, the easy, another easy way to remind, remember it is blind or low vision developers, uh, forward slash notably hyphen artifact. With that, thank you to the many funding bodies that made this work happen and the many colleagues at University of Washington and the Allen School. Happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Venkatesh. Questions? Who's going to take the risk of asking the first one? And just for accessibility reasons, I think I will run the mic over to you. Hey, Venkatesh, uh, James Fogarty. Um, nice to see you talk about this work. I'd, I'd seen the paper, but hadn't seen the talk. Um, you, you mentioned at the end there um, alt text for the kinds of figures that are in these notebooks, right? And I think it's a super interesting question because they're not, they're not static images, and they're also not arbitrary images, right? They, they come from these pipelines. Uh, I know you have thoughts. Do you have thoughts you're willing to share on future approaches to those kinds of questions? Yes. Um, so actually, we did try patching Matplotlib to support the inclusion of alt text, and Jupyter was not picking it up. Uh, in fact, showing like, there's like a deeper issue over there. Um, that's a very like, you know, implementation focused uh, detail that is important. But, you know, there's also scope to use the data frames and information from these data frames to, you know, generate alternative texts as these figures are being generated, right? For example, there are guidelines that uh, Arvind Satyananan's group at MIT has uh, published on what does it mean to make a data visualization accessible and what kind of information about the data we need to include, such as important statistics and so on and so forth. So this data definitely lives in the data frame. So when the image is, be, image is being plotted, there is a possibility for that to be used. Um, and I'll just say this, like, there, I've definitely heard people ask when, if you can use generative AI to kind of generate these uh, descriptions on the fly. I would say we're not ready yet because of the subtle errors that these, visual, you know, these tools can make. They did get numbers wrong. I did try to have visualizations described. They're completely off. So we're not there yet, but hopefully. Well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Venkatesh. And I'm going to introduce you. I just have to bring out my phone again. Yeah. So for our next speaker, we have an aunt. Um, who's advised by James Fogarty. His interests lie in building systems for communication and collaboration in settings where multiple stakeholders have different roles. His research has explored the design and implementation of a patient provider platform to manage depression among patients with cancer and systems for accessible communication among mixed hearing groups. I actually got a private demo of this earlier and it's really great, so I look forward to the talk. Thanks, John. 
Hello, everyone. My, my name is Anant. On behalf of my collaborators, I'm here to present our work, Jode, examining the design and implementation of a video conferencing platform for mixed hearing groups. For anybody in the audience who isn't familiar with accessibility work in this area, I'll first go over a few terms to set the context for the talk. Then I'll briefly go over the design objectives we distill from related work in video conferencing and the design of our system's features followed by a study design where participants tried out Jode. And finally, I'll end my talk with the findings from our user studies and key takeaways for designing future video conferencing platforms. Throughout this talk, I'll use DHH as an acronym for deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, by mixed hearing group, I mean a group comprising of DHH and hearing individuals. Uh, people with hearing impairment may employ multiple communication methods. One of them is speech reading that relies on visual and contextual cues to observe the movement of the speaker's lips to support communication. Um, people also express themselves using sign languages, and sign languages are full-fledged languages uh, with their own grammar and lexicon, and rely on communicating through hand shapes, body movements, uh, and facial expressions. Uh, I will also use the word signers to represent people who communicate using sign language. Uh, finally, the sign language interpreter is a person trained in translating between a spoken and a sign language. And uh, I want to emphasize that their goal is to provide both hearing and DHH people with equal access to information and interactions. So HCI researchers have studied communication barriers in mixed hearing groups and have come up with several challenges and design objectives. The list here on the slide is, is a non-exhaustive list. DHH signers and interpreters prefer keeping the video tiles of other signers in their view, but current platforms offer limited visual layout customizations and automatically resize and re rearrange other video tiles. DHH signers also find it challenging and often feel uncomfortable to get other signers' attention or interject an ongoing conversation with the interpreter's help, with the fear that they might be interrupting the conversation. And uh, another challenge is that people forget to remember appropriate accommodations in mixed hearing groups. For example, hearing people may forget to speak slowly or turn on the video when conversing with DHH people who speech read. And prior work has studied different accessibility barriers in video conferencing and recommended design directions, but they have not been brought together in one system. Uh, so the research goal of our project was to draw upon these desired needs uh, and bring them together in one working platform. And through our study, we aim to understand behaviors and perceptions of people when navigating mixed hearing group conversations using our platform. So I'll now walk you through some of our features. And uh, Jod is a Hindi word. It means link and emphasizes systems goals to connect individuals. So on screen here, we have a snapshot of a video call on Jod. There are few main sections on, in the interface. Taking up about two thirds of the interface is the call itself, where we have video tiles for each of the participants, one of which has been made larger. In this case, it's the interpreter. Uh, below these tiles, we also have captions. And the remaining part of the interfaces are various utilities for the call. We have reactions, call settings, uh, as well as a panel that has a list of people, including indicators for what access needs those people have. There is also an option for chat and a full transcript of the call available right in the interface. This is the first feature. So limited layout customization options in these platforms stops users from personalizing the view of other DHH individuals, active speakers, and interpreters. Now I'll play a video of me using Jode's customizable visual layout feature. In Jode, you can easily resize the video tiles. You can drag them, drop them, rearrange them into a layout you're most comfortable with. You can lock the video tile if you, if you want. You can keep it fixed and unlock it to move it around. And you can further remove the video tile if you like and bring it back. Prior work has discussed DHH signers' frustrations with speaking behaviors such as speaking too fast or at a low volume. In Jode, by hovering over a user's video tile, six buttons appear in the bottom right corner of the tile. These icons can be used to send personalized messages to that, to that participant in the call. Messages include, please look at me, please keep your upper body visible, 
please turn on some lights, please speak slower, and please repeat what you said. These messages get displayed as a toast element in the recipient's UI and do not get dismissed unless they click on it. Jora also lets users share their accessibility needs through icon indicators to other participants on the call. Here we have a picture of a call on Jod, where three people on the call have three different roles, and each has a different icon. There is an icon for the interpreter, which is different from the icon of a hearing participant, and which is different from the icon of a DHH participant. I do want to acknowledge that so far this is a pretty limited set of icons, and people might not personally identify with some of these. But for future developments, we'd love to have features that allow individuals to customize and express their own access needs and abilities to the degrees they want. Moving on to our study design, we conducted six sessions with a total of 34 participants, comprising of 18 DHH signers, 10 hearing individuals, and six sign language interpreters. Uh, Indian Sign Language was the primary mode of communication for the deaf participants. 10 out of 18 could speech read in regional languages, and three of these 10 participants were beginner level speech readers in English. Each session had a mixed group of three DHH participants, two hearing participants, and one to two sign language interpreters. Uh, sessions lasted for approximately 2.5 hours and consisted of multiple rounds that used Jod for communication. First finding, we found that participants' hearing abilities and personal priorities were reflected in their preferred visual layout arrangement. For example, for DHH signers, interpreters were always the priority, and one of the DHH participants shared. I first chose the interpreter and made their tile bigger because the speaking people are not my priority. The interpreter is, is my priority. Being deaf, I want the interpreter screen to be big. One DHH participant explained the layout arrangement preferences. I quote, I would only want to see the deaf participants so I can have all the deaf participants and the speaker on the screen. This allows me to manage the screen so the interpreter and the deaf participant are side by side. On the screen here, we have a representation of a layout arrangement from one DHH participant. The participant on one half of the screen grouped all the DHH participants in one region, then next to that grouped all the hearing participants, and then other half of the screen had the interpreter. Our second finding, we witnessed that participants, use, uh, participants used Jode's preset feedback messages feature to interject, request attention, and influence speaker behavior. However, it also raised the need for acknowledgments and prioritization of received messages based on the ever-changing group communication context. A DHH participant shared the experience of sending a preset message to the interpreter. When we click, can you please repeat, to send it to the interpreter, there is no feedback feature to know if the interpreter has actually received that message. The message has been sent to the interpreter, but how does the sender know that the interpreter has received that message? I'll now finish with two key takeaways for future video conferencing platform designers. First, our participants appreciated the complete flexibility, but they preferred having some support from uh, the system to reduce labor. They requested options and templates for quick layout modifications, uh, similar to how on Zoom, uh, you can hide non-video participants. These templates need to be dynamic and should account for several attributes of the ongoing group conversations. For example, participants' accessibility needs, numbers of signers with active videos, and presence and absence of interpreters. Second, context-aware notifications. In future designs, we could explore how notifications could be less distracting, including how acknowledgments can be sent and received. Also, not all notifications are equally urgent and may have an underlying priority based on the group communication context again. For example, requesting active speakers to repeat what they said is more critical than asking passive participants to adjust their upper body. We also need system-driven notifications to support mixed hearing group. For example, intermittently losing an interpreter's audio or video introduces information gaps in the conversation, similar to how on Zoom, we can see poor internet connectivity messages. Uh, the interpreter's absence can also be communicated at a system level. This brings to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you for listening. I'd like to thank all of my collaborators, study participants, and the funding agencies that helped make this work possible. And that's James when he had short hair. <laughs> that's awesome.
Questions for Anand? Maya. This, it's probably a minor feature to add, but uh, we usually have more than one interpreter and they do a, a swap and that's usually like a bit of an ordeal of like, you know, it's time to swap. And I imagine like uh, with the current Zoom, for instance, you would be uh, spotlighting that person. You have to change who you're spotlighting, et cetera. Has that come up that you could sort of automatically almost like have them coordinate and then uh, the, the interpreter changes. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, that's a completely own research problem in itself, right? Like how do you design for interpreters and how they communicate? Uh, uh, it came up a lot of times in our, in our talk and uh, during our study designs. Uh, um, also, I think interpreters have to switch every 15 minutes, I think, because it's a very physically challenging task. Uh, so I think... Uh, that really needs to be in its own research problem as to how to support uh, the interpreter specifically. And also I feel there is a lot of cultural nuances over there as well. I think it's, it's gonna be very different how those designs might look uh, for uh, communication groups which are in the US versus in India, uh, which my study population was from. I was wondering if that um, customizable uh, layout was also used in an inter in interesting way by hearing people, um, maybe a different way than the kind of templates that we have on Zoom, for example. Yeah. So the question is, uh, the custom the customizable visual layout feature was it used by hearing people as well? It was absolutely, um, because in our study the sessions uh, had almost equal number of DHH participants and equal number of hearing participants, they also change their uh, layout preferences um, uh, as, the, as the group communication context was changing. I think uh, I do talk about it a lot in the paper to see what patterns they have. Um, but given that the interpreter is of equally, holds equal importance uh, in our situation, they also gave a lot of importance to the interpreter, but they didn't increase its size of the video tile as much as the DHH participants did, uh, rightly so. Let's thank our speaker. I don't know how many of us basically are re-implementing Zoom during their PhD, but <laughs> that's awesome. All right, uh, I'm delighted to introduce our next set of speakers, which is Ashka and Alea. So Ashka is a fourth year PhD student advised by uh, Jen Mankoff and Richard Ladner. Her research focuses on deaf and hard of hearing communication, accessibility, and designing tech that supports languaging. And Alea is a third year PhD student at UW, advised by James Fogarty. Her research focuses on designing more equitable speech recognition systems that support people of color with disabilities who have varying dialects. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alea. This is Ashka. Um, and on behalf of our collaborators, Christina Harrington, uh, Sonica Morana, Annie Spencer Ross, and Jen Mankoff, uh, we'll be sharing our assets paper titled Working at the Intersection of Race, Disability, and Accessibility. So, we'd first like to situate um, some of the background that led to our analysis. While ableism and racism uh, commonly collide in everyday life, the intersection of these constructs um, is mostly absent from both accessibility research as, rel as well as race in um, HCI research. So we have begun to see that isolating these constructs or leaving out one or the other uh, in the analysis of accessibility research creates a default user who is often white, um, has education, and has access to resources. However, in many uh, instances, the prevalence of those with disability is often higher among people of color, thus suggesting the need to consider uh, race, ethnicity, and culture when we do accessibility work. So on this slide, uh, we have a bar graph that displays the percentages of people with disabilities. The x-axis indicates the percentage and the white uh, access uh, is labeled by three categories, including race, age group, and educational attainment. But we want to specifically point to the race section. Uh, the takeaway with this graph is there's a high prevalence of people with disabilities in communities of color. So for the purpose of this talk, 
we contextualize that both race and disability are social constructs uh, that are often positioned among the societal environment of an individual. Both of these constructs have definitions that vary and have evolved over time, and identifying with these uh, can lead to potentially undesirable effects when it comes to housing, when it comes to employment, or when it comes to access to other resources. And we know that these constructs have meaning in research, um, yet little work meaningfully engages with this important intersection. Works by scholars and humanities, such as Patricia Hill Collins, assert that centering uh, at the intersection of racial justice and disability rights movements present a, quote, unifying lens to understand the roots of both race and disability discrimination and the nature of the harms experienced by those with intersectional identities, end quote. And on the slide, it shows the Black Disabled Lives Matter uh, FIST logo. So in order for our work to be truly disability inclusive, we must recognize and learn about the ways in which the experiences of people of color with disabilities and biases such as racism and ableism are deeply linked. On the slide, we have a quote that reads, racism and ableism are often thought of as parallel systems of oppression that work separately to perpetuate social hierarchy. Society treats people of color in in specific ways that create barriers, and these poor conditions create disability. The concept of disability has been used to justify discrimination against other groups by attributing disability to them." End quote. So we have seen researchers apply theoretical frameworks of intersectionality to HCI and technology studies um, as a framework to examine race and social class in regard to socio-technical systems arguing that this lens and research approach has the potential to bring about solidarity within the HCI community. However, this requires far more than simply checking a box of race, class, or gender and simply reporting it as categorical data. We instead must um, understand the politics that come with these identity facets in its intersection. So to jump back and briefly uh, provide a bit of uh, context on how this project started, um, in the fall of 2020, two members of our team, Jennifer Mankoff and Annie Spencer-Ross, um, led a research seminar on race, disability, and technology. And in developing a reading list and discussions for the seminar, it was a real to scarcity to work in this, in this area. Um, so this realization is what led us to thinking about how can we establish a framework that thinks about the intersection of race and disability and meaningfully engaging in that intersection. So today we present a working framework for engaging with the intersection of race and disability and accessibility research by highlighting considerations at each stage within the research process. So we'll go ahead and jump into the framework, starting with stage one, formalization. This is a stage where researchers may define what it is meant by race, disability, um, and their intersection, and then use that to guide the phenomenon that is to be studied. And this is informed by theories that draw separately from both race and disability, such as critical race theory um, and disability justice, as well as theories and frameworks uh, from intersectionality as well. So our second stage is framing and scoping, and in this stage, Researchers decide um, what questions are worth answering. And to do this, the dynamics of knowledge production need to be interrogated, and they need to be reimagined. Thanks, Ale. This is Ashka. Um, so moving on to the next stage, methods. In both choosing and executing methods, there's an opportunity to engage with race and disability. Um, for example, are the research methods accessible to both the participants and the researchers? Do they allow for the identification of root causes and development of insights based on lived experience? Um, and in the process of executing these methods, it's important to remember that it's a continual iterative process, um, and there's a need to continuously interrogate your work and question if there are unintended consequences and negative impacts to marginalized communities. 
And then the last stage, analysis and writing. It's important to carry these intersectional goals that have guided the research all the way to the writing process. And here again, there's a space to recognize how researchers' own identities and biases have shaped the work. Now in the paper, we use this framework to examine three existing exemplary papers from the field of HCI and accessibility. In searching for papers, we looked for those that went beyond just listing demographics and actually engaged with the constructs of race and disability. Um, this is a growing research area, so these are not the only papers out there, but we found these to be exemplary. The first paper is Bennett et al.'s. It's complicated. Negotiating accessibility and misrepresentations in image description of race, gender, and disability. This paper discusses tensions around image descriptions and the need to critically assess each category of identity in accessible descriptions. Particularly, it highlights the need to consider context when describing race, gender, and disability in image descriptions. And they mentioned that ignoring or assuming context might actually be more harmful. The second paper is Gonzales, Designing for Intersectional Interdependent Accessibility, a case study of multilingual content creation. This paper argues for considering both language access and accessibility in crafting digital content, and they highlight the tensions that exist in doing so. They emphasize that accessibility, as well as cultural and racial practices, influence every stage of research development, including research dissemination or the creation of digital content. The third and final paper is Hermides. I'm okay because I'm alive, understanding sociocultural accessibility barriers for refugees with disabilities in the United States. It examines the issues of access to healthcare services as experienced by refugees with disabilities and identifies the need to make both disability services and healthcare services more culturally sensitive. Some highlights of our analysis. Um, all of the case studies included some form of formalization, but race is treated differently in each paper. In framing, each paper uh, connects intersectional issues to the design of technology. The methods used were guided by the populations they were working with. Um, and then in writing, we found examples of servicing of power relationships and discussions of author identity. So to conclude, some final thoughts. Assumptions of defaults hinders the inclusiveness of the entire research process. While we present this paper as a paper, much of the conversation about engaging with race and disability is happening outside the ivory tower of academia. We've tried our best to cite blogs, op-eds, and reference these community organizations, but we must work to create safe spaces that increase the representation of people working at this intersection in our field. Thank you. Really wonderful work demonstrates that in the Allen School, we're also doing a lot of theoretical considerations about the future of uh, accessibility research questions. It's not all just algorithms. <laughs> I'd be curious to ask, um, I know neither of you are working in this space directly as your dissertation area, but do you plan to follow through with any of this work, maybe with your collaborators? Um, so some of the work um, that I'm like currently getting into, um, yeah, looks at the intersection of race and disability specifically for like speech recognition systems. Um, as a lot of work um, in speech separately looks at um, people who have uh, dialects that vary from standard English um, and their engagement with speech recognition systems. And there's a little work that looks at people who stuttered, but um, work done separately in this area is really overlook those nuances. Um, so 
that's the work that I'm moving into. So into you can it. use this framework to, to sort of help exactly. guide that, that yeah, work. Oh, that's we wonderful. Act, yeah, we kind of point to a few of these areas within the paper. So if you all are interested in looking at what areas, um, sorry, um, you can like do more intersectional research um, that examines the, the intersection of race and disability, then we'll refer you all to the paper. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, um, in my work, I look at how we can in, engage in this intersection in the context of deaf and hard of hearing individuals who are multilingual. Um, so that's a research, a lot of research focuses in English context, or yeah. uh, only one language at a time, and a lot of people who are multilingual switch languages, and there's of course people who are multilingual and deaf and hard of hearing. So how do we create captioning technology that supports their needs? Wonderful, thank you both. Let's thank our speakers again. And last but not least, and I don't need my phone for this one because this is my own PhD student, Sha Su, who is a third year PhD student. And he actually has a background in architecture. He's exploring techniques to use LIDAR and computer vision to build 3D reconstructions and examine the accessibility of indoor environments. Thank you, John. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Xia Su from the Makeability Lab of UWCSE. I work with John on a daily basis. And today I'm talking about our recent submission to Kai. It's called Razar, Room Accessibility and Safety Scan in Augmented Reality. So here on the screen, we see a carefully designed home space. It might seem nice living room in many people's eyes. However, it, it might not be the situation for everyone. For example, when a wheelchair user visits this place, they instantly faces unreachable spaces in this room, as well as doorknobs that is too high, thus also unreachable. That's not the only case. For older adults with weaker leg muscles, the cozy looking sofa is too low for them to stand up. And for blind or low vision people and children, the sharp edges and corners might be dangerous for them. And for all these communities, the unsecured throw rug may trip them. All these risks are very common in people's homes, but we just cannot see them. This common neglect creates unfairness in our indoor spaces. We believe that safe and accessible home space is a fundamental human right. However, most people live in pre-existing spaces, which requires careful auditing and renovation to improve safety and accessibility which is hard. In order to conduct home modification to fulfill accessibility needs, people could seek professional help from occupational therapists. But this requires complex and lengthy approval process and with limited service providers and funding, and also varying geographical locations and socioeconomical barriers. So many people wouldn't have the privilege of professional consultancy. So getting help from occupational therapists could be hard, but how about we do it by ourselves? Which can also turn out to be hard. If people decide to DIY this process by themselves, they could face difficulty in finding the right instruction among the countless information sources. And also the measuring process and the solution finding can still be hard for some people. Based on these difficulties, we want to seek a new answer to the question. How can we assist the general public to conduct indoor auditing? Luckily, the recent development of computer vision and mobile devices have enabled us to conduct real-time indoor object detection that helps us to find the find accessibility and safety-related objects in indoor spaces. Additionally, the LiDAR sensors, which tracks the traveling time of light and provides depth information of the scene, are also introduced to many phones, which further helps indoor understanding. Based on all these technical advances, we designed and implemented the Razar system. And let me show this system with a video demo. Razar is a mobile AR system that semi-automatically detects accessibility and safety issues in real time. With Razar, user could scan a home space in minutes and get real-time feedback about potential accessibility and safety risks. Rezar's user interaction starts with selecting target accessibility communities.
Currently, we support four communities, wheelchair users, blind or low vision people, older adults, and families with young children. By selecting one or multiple user communities, we could provide customization to users' specific accessibility needs. After selection, user scans indoor space with phone and gets real-time feedback about the indoor reconstruction, shown with a minimap that rotates with the user's facing direction, and about detected accessibility and safety issues, like table height, throw rug, and scissors, shown with pop-up icons. User could click any icon to show more details about this specific issue, then either confirm this issue and get back to the scanning process, or deny this issue and remove it from the scanning process. Currently, we support four categories of issues. Object dimension, like a table being too high or too low. Object position, like an electric socket being too high or low. Risky items, like throw rug and sharp objects. And lack of assistive items, like no grab bars near toilets. After the scanning is finished, user could use a button to end the scan and get a 3D reconstruction as a summary of the scan results. User could pan, zoom, and move the 3D model to inspect certain parts and click any object to see more details. User can also remove any detected issues at this phase. User can use an export button to export scan results as a JSON file. But since indoor information can be privacy sensitive, we use a warning to make sure users are aware of this risk. If users choose not to export, then no data will be stored. So in general, the RESAR system conducts semi-automatic assessment of indoor accessibility and safety issues. The tool, does three, the tool does three things. First, it identifies the problems in indoor spaces. Second, it localizes where the problem exists. And thirdly, it displays summary and helpful suggestions to user. When scanning, the RESAR tool scans the home space with LiDAR and camera and processes the data stream with object detection model and Apple's room plan API. This results in a parametric room reconstruction containing information like the object label, like what it is, the object position, and its dimension, how high, how wide it is. Based on these information, we can run accessibility and safety rubrics on the scan results and visualize all the, de all the findings in AR. In order to make sure we're not misleading our users, we conducted an extensive literature review to prov provide a solid support of rubrics and guidelines for RESAR. The sources include like ADA design standards for accessible design, a lot of journal publications, and many well-recognized assessment tools for home accessibility like HSSAT shown on the screen. Without these resources, we form a list of accessibility issues with respective relevance to different communities. Our current tool supports 20 of this, these issues listed in this table, and we plan to include more in our future versions. The current list of 20 issues has respective relevance to our four target communities. In this case, the user can just customize their scanning results by selecting what are their uh, accessibility communities they have in mind. Also, another important technical component of RESAR is we conducted a, a collection of image data to form a indoor accessibility and safety data set that contains around 2,500 images. We annotated these images and also trained an object detection model that could both be used in the RESAR project but also help the future indoor accessibility related works. To test the performance of the RESAR system, we conducted a technical evaluation by scanning 10 home spaces and evaluate these results in terms of uh, accuracy, consistency, uh, scanning times, and also the, yeah, sorry, the scanning time. And based on these results, we can see that the RESAR system is being robust and consistent in generally in most cases. And the scans, which takes around one and a half minutes to finish, 
are also way faster than the, than the manual auditing of these indoor spaces, which usually takes more than 30 minutes to finish. So in general, in, in future, we envision our tool could be used not only in our people's own homes by, to conduct these evaluations by themselves, but also to uh, be applied in clinical uses with occupational therapists so that occupational therapists can conduct remote uh, evaluation of the spaces. And also we envision that hotels and Airbnbs can also benefit a lot from this kind of tool because they could just conduct a scan and uh, upload the scan to their website so that people can just directly access that uh, instead of asking like 20 questions to them or uh, ask for a video call to ensure the accessibility of their space. And also businesses like restaurants and other public spaces can potentially also benefit from this by conducting these kind of scans and ensure their space is safe for their customers. Uh, this is uh, all we have for today. Thank you. I know we're slightly over in time, but I wanted to give Shaw an opportunity to hear one question. So if there is a question for Shaw, yeah, Maya. From the list of things you didn't include, what are mm -hmm. some favorites that you're working on and maybe the reason you couldn't include it? Like what's a technical challenge that needs to be solved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. There could be a lot of challenges, especially because uh, indoor reconstruction is still a relatively new thing. And um, for a lot of the existing work, their focus is just not on accessibility. So we have to like implement our own layer of object detection and a lot of other technical stuff to to make sure we collect the enough information to say, okay, this is, is accessible or not. This is just like one big gap that we find in all the existing things. So even for Apple, who provided a lot of like very important technical backbones for this project, still doesn't have accessibility in their mind in their own scanning API. So we have to add a lot of actual work to make sure this work is focused on, focused on accessibility. A uh, concrete example is we can detect that something is a chair. We can also detect uh, various heights, uh, but we may not, not be able to detect exactly the height of the chair bottom. So we're working on like planar surface detection and then also different pieces. So if the chair doesn't have a back, that could be an accessibility issue. Uh, so there's a variety of different parts of sub pieces of objects that you might want to automatically detect. So awesome. Thank you very much for your attention. Let's thank our speakers again. And remember to check out Create and our holiday party in the fall. <laughs>